I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on today, the Wajak Noongar people, and offer my respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and particularly those who are with us here tonight. Um, welcome, my name is Susan McEwen and I'm the Acting Director of Library Services here at the State Library, um, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Len Collard. Um, Professor Collard is a Wajak Noongar elder and a respected traditional owner of the Perth metropolitan area and surrounding lands, rivers and oceans. Len is an Australian Research Council Chief Investigator with the School of Indigenous Studies at the University of Western Australia. Tonight you will hear Len talk about his groundbreaking language research that is increasing the understanding of the many characteristics of Noongar places, names, sites and people. Just before I hand you over, um, I just need to go through some minor housekeeping. Um, if you've been here before, you'll know that the toilets are directly across the foyer. And in the unlikely event of an emergency, um, please follow myself or one of the State Library staff that are around. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, and we do ask that you wait and use the microphones provided because we are recording tonight's presentation, and that will be available online for those who can't make it tonight. Um, if you do not want to be recorded, please make sure you let the staff member know by the end of the session. Now, please put your hands together for Professor Len Collard. Nijabujara and Buruan Ngan Murong and Yinalang. And um, to, to uh, anyone, anyone want to have a go at translating? I saw some language experts here walking around. <laughs> Where are they? Yep. Uh, yeah, that's right, yeah. I was talking about our family being here in the past, we're here today and we're here in the future. And um, um, who's interested in Noongar place names? Uh, so, if we were looking out from Kart Jenning in Bow, where are we looking from? Kings Park. Kings Park. The irony of it is, of course, it's not called Kings Park. And part of the um, the the, uh, uh, the recolonising of our country is through the place names. And I think um, I've heard a lot of people talk about place names and that um, you know using the colonisers' discourse on our country without our permission. And it's um, a, a problem that's began in 1829 when people uninvitedly came onto our country and took up occupation without our permission. And <coughs> lo and behold, as time went along, they, um, they uh, put their uh, own identities and their own uh, words and terminologies on our country. And so um, it's a big challenge in Australia and certainly uh, people that live in the Noongar Buja, let alone the Yamaji countries or the Wongais or the Kuris or the Murrays, is about dealing with the, um, the place names. And um, so uh, School of Indigenous Studies, History and Motions, uh, originally funded it. Uh, uh, Linda, where's Linda? Linda Martin's at the back there somewhere hiding. Linda uh, and uh, uh, Josh. Josh um, was one of our team and Paulina and myself. Um, yeah, we put in for a small grant and uh, we got it. So um, we, uh, we decided to um, do what scholars do. We thought we'd do some uh, uh, research around place names. And this talk uh, really is looking um, um, not necessarily from Kart Jenning in Bow, but Kart Jenning in Bow uh, is one of the localities um, which is near the University of WA. Um, and so what we did is we, we applied for a small grant, uh, which we got, I think it was 4, 4K, and out of that we um, did, did the uh, work. Uh, I think we ended up with a little power, uh, little uh, website. We ended up with a, uh, a PowerPoint. We could do lectures or public conversations. Um, and then one of the things that I talked to my colleagues about was that, you know, uh, a part of the challenge for scholarship is you do research, you produce whatever you agree with, with the people that give you the boyer. And then um, and one of the things that we said we wanted to do uh, was to publish a paper. So just to give you the heads up, in the next edition of the Westerly, being published by the University of WA, the, uh, the paper uh, will be, um, um, be in the next uh, version. So um, 
Linda uh, and I basically ended up doing the last bit. Um, by then, I think everyone got tuckered out. Um, and uh, uh, so we hung in there. So what, what I uh, want to do is um, just go through the slide. I won't read it verbatim, um, but you can read it and I'll have a chin wag uh, uh, as I go along. Um, as you've probably all become much more familiar now uh, through Welcome to Countries and other cultural diplomatic engagements, um, you know, Kaya is, is one of the key words. Um, uh, it can mean um, good day, how are you? Um, or, and it can also uh, um, like be a greeting or it can be a, a, an acknowledgement or a yes, so to speak. So there's a couple of different um, uses of that word. So uh, when, when I was a young bloke, uh, we grew up in Wycombe Valley as a family and <clears throat> in those days um, we were pretty fortunate actually because my old man worked for a farmer, um, Mr Evans, and Mr Evans basically lent the old man £5,000 I think it was. So as Noongars, we li li moved to the city, but not a part of the stolen generation or any other reason other than we wanted to go to the city because that's where all the action would be. And uh, we, we had uh, access to funds to purchase property. So our family in Wycombe Valley, that was, um, bought, a, bought a humble little house. And um, one of the things that went on around our table at home was, uh, you know, basically we, we spoke um, in the way that we speak. And so I, I guess some, some people might describe it as... Uh, you know, um, Noongar English or English Noongar or Noongar Noongar with some English or whatever you want to call it. Um, but at the same time, there was, there was a thick layer of just Noongar. You know, kaya nunukat kep nga ninyo, nunukat wot kulin yam gunki wa, nunukat barang in nitya, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we, we had that uh, uh, privilege to grow up in the city, have all the modern benefits of brick house and all the rest, go to school, there's brick tar roads. So, you know, um, uh, and on top of that, the language was just core normal business. So it wasn't something special. It was just, you know, if, you, if your nana and pop or someone said, go, you know, barring in boring uh, and your car, go and get some wood for the fire, well, you went and got it. You didn't, you know, sort of have to tell me in English to do that. And uh, I think I, I, I kind of come to realise um, that, uh, you know, talking to, to the grandfather, you know, by the time I went to university, because the big challenge at uni was that to train Aborigines to become Westernised. That's what that that's what academy does. It teaches them how to become Wadulas. And um, one of the things that I uh, I guess because I had a pretty solid upbringing, a good and solid upbringing. Uh, when I went to uni, I remember one of the uh, ladies there, very nice lady, but I was a young guy, you know, full of testosterone and cheeky, and she come and said to me, "Oh, you've come to." Um, come to university to, to learn about your people. I said, no, I come here to learn about your people. <laughs> I, I already know who my people are, but I want to find out what's going on amongst you people because, um, um, you know, by in the 60s in Australia and the 50s, obviously it wasn't necessarily a, a glowingly welcome spot for Noongars. And so in a nutshell, my pop said, you know, one day, Lenny, uh, you, when you become a man, you're going to have to stand up in front of people and you're going to um, be, uh, be uh, having a yarn and... I don't know if the old, old boy had a crystal ball under his bed or what, but what he said kind of come true. Uh, one of the things um, was that um, when I was studying, I, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was doing a program in youth study, so the question was how, do you, how, how in the modern world, so to speak, do you inculcate the values of the old culture or any culture into the young ones? And that's a question not just for Noongars, but that's a question for all cultures. How do you transport the language? I mean, I went to school at South Mount High School where there's a lot of Italians and Portuguese and Croatians and English and Irish and Pakistanis and you name it, they were there. And, um, um, you know, so I, I know when I talked to my mates, you know, there was a, the same challenge. You, you, you keep turn, learn, you know, keep continuing the Italian language in the home. And, of course, some people did and some didn't. For whatever reason, they just decided not to continue language and... Um, and so we were in the same boat, so to speak. Um, so when I was studying, um, I doing youth studies, I had to figure out, well, how, how, does, how does language operate? How do the values of culture and knowledge of your budja and, and, and your murang and your people and, and the kadich, the knowledge or the science, how, how does that work? And so that become the big question for me is how do I hold my ground but enjoy the opportunity to interrogate Western disciplinary work, got to know what these people are about so I can understand what they're talking about, um, but at the same time continue to um, nourish the, the Noongar terrain. And um, 
as that first slide uh, said, there was there's there's five there's more than five thousand Noongar place names on the official database at um, at uh, Landgate. It's called Landgate today. They changed their name that much. You can't work it either. And um, so, um, but always it was a, a thing of interest. And I, I kind of poked around at it all, all my life, really, in academy. And uh, embarrassing to say, you look back at what you did and you think, geez, you were a bloody idiot. But you've got to learn by your mistakes and uh, hopefully you grow out of that. So um, uh, before 2018, I'd, I'd had an ARC around Noongar place names. But this little project is really about the one that was funded by the um, Centre for Emotions and with the colleagues I mentioned, uh, their names are up there, Linda and uh, Josh and Paulina. So... Um, uh, when I uh, said to my colleagues, well, let's go for a small grant, what the idea was that we, we wanted to develop capacity. I, I want to develop capacity of my colleagues, collegial stuff that helps to build, you know, your 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 relationships with people and, and uh, the idea, as I've mentioned, we're going to produce certain outputs. But uh, of the 5,000, um, still many of those are untranslated. Um, so the good news is, is that... Um, Hopefully, it will inspire people to have a think about how you might have a crack at working out what the, the Noongar place name is on the suburb where you live or maybe the street you live or the uh, places you like hanging around. So we picked eight. And um, the thing about it is uh, people keep asking me for years and years and years, you know, um, uh, which which uh, version of Noongar is right? Is it N Y U N G A R? Is it N W O N G A R? Which N word is right? You know the N word, <laughs> Noongar. And um, the 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 tr the thing was that the it, the literary history of construction of Noongar terminology on paper, uh, it's the white fellas that done that. The white fellas they wrote it on a piece of paper. And so people say, but there's all these different words and there's all these different spellings. You know, you, you Noongar, has it, has it got to do with your uh, languages, language variation? No, it's got nothing to do with Noongar language variation. It's got to do with the variation that Wodgelers wrote them down on the transcripts, the word list. So Noongar's inherit this data, this information from the literary literature, the historical literature, and we're sitting there going, I can't even, I can't even work out what these what these wadulas written down on a piece of paper. Can't work it out. Um, so people seem to think it's got something to do with the, the different dialects that all these Noongar speak. You know, the Noongars that live on this side of the road, they don't, they don't speak the same Noongars or Noongars across the road. You know, or the Noongar up the street, he, he talks different to the Noongar that lives around the corner. <laughs> I think, oh, okay. Oh, interesting. So um, there's, there's a lot of prob problematic uh, commentary around... Um, Around it, but as you can, you know, sort of see, um, you know, th th there's there's a real plethora of stuff that's been coming up um, around Noongar place names and and what their meanings are. And so, uh, I, with with uh, my colleagues, we we sort of sat down and sort of theorised and, and yarned and indulged in all manner of cock and bull conversations. But what we decided to do was to focus on um, eight places. Um, anyone heard of the place called Derby Erigan? Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean? Does it? And the, and the irony of it is that this is where the problem lies. In the public discourse on the written literature, and even Noongars will tell you that Derby Erigan means Swan River. Now, as in pe people in academy like me, it's not my job just to accept stuff. It's my job to interrogate it and pull it apart and deconstruct it, do the discourse analysis, put up some different theoretical conclusions and then try and write a summary to it. Because in the world of academy, you've got to have an informed discussion and you've got to pro provide evidence to confirm the claims that you make. So that's the challenge. I mean, how the hell do I do that? I mean, every other Noongar that, that in the street, they can say Derby Erigan means Swan River and nobody cares. They say, oh, that's beautiful. But as I'll dem demonstrate shortly, shortly, because I have to confirm the critique, because we've inherited too much gobbledygook, too much confusion from the historical um, er narrative. So, Kutantalup, anyone uh, know uh, where Kutantalup is or what it means? It's a lovely place. You'll find out shortly. Buladalangup. 
how, how many generations have you people lived in Tununga Buja? Did you get here off a boat yesterday? Well, you've been here one generation or three or four or five or ten. And, and I'm only asking that obviously just to, 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 to um, arc you up. But the point is, is that I'm making through place things. We've got people living in our country, and it's not just Wadjalas, Noongars too, they, don't know, they can't explain what the science is. These are, these are public signage that we drive past and, and engage in every day. Uh, so, Buja Gepalap, Gepalap, Buja Gepalap. Kart Jenning in Bo means Kings Park, doesn't it? No. no. Kings Park means Kings Park, and there's, there's no such a place as King Park. It was a figment of someone's imagination, just like the Noongar imagination. Someone else imagined something else. Birit, Manda Yurunup, and uh, Manda Gamanup. So some of these places are officially on the Landgate database, and some of them aren't. But I, I put a little uh, quote in uh, from Aunty Judy's action. She's gone now, but you know, uh, back in I think it was about '98, we interviewed people in and around um, the river space, and she tells a little story there. And she even had a different name. Uh, she talked about um, the river as a place called Gapi Darbo, and all those words are just different words to describe something in a different way. But in sometimes in in the world of language, people um, think that you can only have one translation of one thing and you, you can't change it. But, um, and even one place can only have one name. That, that's not the case. Like, for example, as a young bloke, I used to go to Kartjana in Bo. Anyone know where Kartjana in Bo is? See how quickly you can tap into the, the, the difference in the discourse? And I used to go to Kartjana in Bo, <laughs> and being a young bloke, you only went to Kartjana in Bo, not for the scene. Re, what do you think I would go to Kart Jenning and Bo and who would I take there? <laughs> anyway, so I've got a different name, Kart Jenning and Bo. <laughs> so um, the thing about it is, um, you know, as you can see through this text, one of the things that we uh, negotiated was to write in a discourse which reflected the way that we speak. And so in a sense, the way that we're writing in this text is what I call Southwest Australian. It's not, it's not Eastern Australian, it's not Northwest Australian, it's not Central, this is Southwest Australian. And the relationship between Noongar language and the foreign language of English, there's a two-way street going on. There is a colonising and a colonising. They're both colonising one another to the extent now that in the Southwest of uh, Western Australia, um, you know, people uh, might say, well, we speak English. And others might say, no, we speak Noongar. And others might say, we sp speak English or Noongar English, whatever they call it. But our language that we speak here is a part of the Australian language scape, but it's, it, our, the home is here. And it's, it's a hybrid or a mixture between the, the two languages, the insiders and the outsiders. And so, you know, um, I often ask people, do you speak Noongar? And people, oh, yeah, do you speak Noongar, you people? Put your hand up if you do. Well, the point is, is, is you do take a little bit and you cannot but engage Noongar because if you can't, if you don't understand that Balga and, and um, Mandogalup and Querading and Kubalup, and, you know, they're, they're all Noongar words. You cannot move around this country unless you read a Noongar word on a sign. You might not know what it means, but you must be engaged in the home language because it's there. And, um, you know, the, the, um, when the Noongars took the state to court over the native title stuff, you know, the, the Noongars spoke to the judge in Noongar. Hey, Abridi, yeah, no, 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 away from their culture. We live in the city. We might walk around in suits and ties up and down St George's Terrace, looking pretty flash. But so what? We're Noongars. This is our country. We've never ceded it. And the place names is, is one of those um, um, uh, concepts which really um, continues to, to um, inspire Noongar ownership over country. So, you know, when, when we're using the words like Noongar cultural biddy, the pathway, the knowledge trails... 
um, you know, that was the journey as a team we kind of went along and we bounced back and forth. Each, each person had, um, a, um, had a role to play in contributing to, to the outcome. And the thing about it is, is that um, um, we, uh, through the word list, um, I, I had a database of about 25,000 words in my word list from right across southwest Australia, which is out of the ARC. And the benefit of having the database was I could type in a word and I could get a range of responses from right across the southwest. So, you know those Noongars that live up the road? They don't speak the same Noongars as the fellows across the road. You know that one? I was testing it. I'm testing the theory. Is that the case? So what I realised is that when I typed in the word for a kangaroo, which again is not English, it's an Eastern Stokes Aboriginal word, when I typed in, typed in that word, or if I typed in a, um, the word water, the irony of it was I had to type in foreign words to track down the Noongar words. Does that sound a bit weird? It was back to front. You know, surely I should be able to type in you know, the Noongar word for water or for kangaroo and I should get it. But the problem was that if I spelt it the way I spelt it, well, I might not pick up anything. Or if I did, I might pick up one. Because, you know, all the wadulas I talked about that wrote our words down on a piece of paper? Well, they wrote it all different ways. So the only way I could track it was to write it, write the word kangaroo and so all the yongers came up or all the queers come up or all the um, you know, uh, bookers came up or the darch, the meat, the kangaroo skins, the little, little uh, bush kangaroos or the, or the big grey ones came up. And um, so uh, by using that uh, word list, and, and the tools and resources, I can cross-check and go back and forth. What have these Albany Noongars got to say about the, the, the Yonga? Yep, same word, different spelling. Why? Not because the Noongars wrote it down, it's because some Wadjala fellow wrote it down you know, in, in the past and stuff like that. So the, um, the, you know, we, we can talk about the 50,000 years and stuff and blah, 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 but as, as we you know, went along the, the Cutter and Booty uh, Trail, uh, you know, one of the things I said, you know, in Academy, we operate in a critical culture, a, a culture of critique and analysis and review. We don't live in a culture of just accept. We, we just don't accept the fact that the Derbal Yarrigan means Swan River because the fact is it doesn't mean what Swan River. And so then the question would be, so what does it mean? Is that a fair question? Cool. What does it mean? I've got no idea what it means. Not one of you, I've probably got many. So the, the, um, the idea was that, um, uh, as I talked to my colleagues, I said, listen, you know, part of the problem with this, these place names is what happened was when the people who listened to it, whether they were Irish or whether they were Welsh or whether they were English from Yorkshire or English from London town, they all heard it different. And even still today, people hear it different. So the, um, the thing was, was that um, we had to, uh, we, we, like I, I mean, I, I had an epiphany previously about what was going on, but what I realised was that the place names, as a word, in actual fact, is incorrect. The place name, uh, on some cases, yes, they are words. Yonga, street. Oh. Kangaroo street. Okay, I can get that. But what happens when the word is... Um, what's that big word on the road down to Mandra? Yeah. That's a big long word, isn't it? No, it's not a word. I keep telling you that it's not a word. It's a sentence. It's a phrase. And so, the, so then you had to say, OK, well then how do we crack the ancient codes of the Noongar place names? Because if we only accept that it's, it's, it's one word, it's not one word. It's a number of words in a sentence that's being contracted together. And so once we um, come to that conclusion, then we say, okay, so now this is where the discourse analysis comes in or the cr critical review of the terminology. We've got to try and figure out what's going on. And so um, I think Linda came up with this little, um, little hierarchy and basically it, was a, it's, it's a, it represents the literature review the place name stuff that we track down, we then put it into the big database so we've got an engine that we can use to review things, go back and forward. Um, we also um, uh, have, have um, you know, 
communication. You've got to have someone that can, you know, or got experience in this or they can speak language and, and a, a combination of two. And then that little process there tries to help us to untangle um, these small segments or um, these, this, the little words within the sentence. <clears throat> and so um, what, what we did was um, we, we, we said, yeah, let's, let's uh, do the social critique, look at the wanging or the words and try and figure out what's, what's going on. And so um, what we decided to do in this presentation is we looked at each place name, so Derby Yerrigan. If you go down to the Derby Yerrigan Aboriginal Health Service, anyone been to the Aboriginal Health Service? Yeah, if you go down there, uh, Derby Yerrigan, that's where it gets its name from. That Derby Yerrigan agency was set up in the 70s and um, from my um, uh, oral narrative, I understand that um, someone gave them the name, obviously. And then someone then decided to translate it into meaning Swan River. So um, what, I, what I did with my colleagues, okay, well, well let's have a go at t testing the theory, the theory that we've been articulating. Can we use that theoretical proposition to do the discourse analysis to render it down into, into little words as the big sentence and then do the analysis to work out what each word's saying? So um, da or de or ta or da, it doesn't matter which way you spell it, it's talking about your mouth or the access or the entrance to da. So da bell. Oh, hang on, da bell. It's actually, there's two sounds, isn't it? One, two. Oh, that's two words. Da and bill. And so um, um, there's all we all we use all these different ways of spelling it because people get really get quite um, conflicted and some people get sort of a bit angry that you know there's so many different spellings or there's so many different interpretations or whatever. Which, which I can understand that I, I um, so what I decided when I talked to my colleagues, I said, well, maybe we, we spell it a whole range of different ways so you can see that there is all different ways of spelling things um, because, you know, that's just the way the Wadjalas wrote the words down on the, uh, on the lists, the word lists, whether it's in, um, you know, um, Kinjaling, which is, which is, isn't the word for Albany either. But, um, you know, or whether it was, um, you know, uh, uh, Beverly or Querding or, or Margaret River or Albany or, or wherever they wrote it or even you know, Bishop Salvo does work up, up um, in your country. And so you can see there that um, there's all these different um, words and translations and so from there you can suddenly start to look at it and say, okay, so Derbal Yerrigan, if, if it's true, then what you're saying, um, uh, something to do with the access of it or she or they that rose... Um, and, and about me. So there's a little sentence going on there. And I think what it kind of means is the, the, ex, the, uh, uh, the opening of it or she or they, because Baal is the third person. You know, Baal over there, that person over there. You know, usually Baal is, yeah, he's crazy. I'm going to talk to him. You know. um, and Yira, double Yiragun. Yiragun means to rise. Yiriyak. And anyone been to the Yiriyak and Aboriginal theatre? Well, you go and look at Yiriyak, and their word Yira means to stand up or rise. Um, and then the uh, uh, the the Ngan, um is I or me, and then the Beel, uh, Bielu, Bielia, Bielo, blah blah blah. And so. Um, you can suddenly look at it and think, oh, okay, there's a different narrative going on here. And the question is, where is the swan? <laughs> don't know. I don't know where the swan is. I mean, the swan might be on the bee. The swan might be sitting on the water. The, uh, uh, what's the word for a swan? The swan is um, kuliak or um, mali. Mali's not up there um, uh, in, in terms of the, the words for um, swan river. Mali and thing not there. Um, uh, Yurigan, Durbal Yurigan, Swan River. Okay, what's the word for swan, uh, for river in Nunga? It's not there either. So you can see that you've got to go through a critical process to break this thing down, and because what it's telling you isn't what the translation is, and the the challenge we got is people are just picking things up without critical thought or thinking and say, oh well, I saw it in a book, so that's what it, it must be true. Well. This is why we've got to do the critical analysis. Um, what was the next one? Durbal, Yerrigan, Estuary at the front of the city of Perth. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, the, the thing about the, the, the Bielia 
or what people call the Swan River. So as you can see in the text, there's little references to, to, to the words that, that um, if we were translating Swan River, well, if Beely means river, well, that should be in, it should be in the Durbu Yerrigan. Or if it was Swan, it, sh it should be in that translation. But it's not there because that's not what it means. It means something else. We, again, we, we used some of the, the oral narratives of, of elders that are gone now. Um, but, you know, so that the idea of having the oral narrative is reminding us that, you know, people um, still talk about these, these, you know, these dream time narratives, which are real. They're not made up sort of, um, you know, sort of mythical uh, sort of stories in, in the eyes and the understanding of Nungas. These are real uh, factual events. So another place um, which is close to my heart um, is where we work. We work at uh, Nedlands on the UWA campus um, and um, uh, Kutandalup. So you can see from the literature up on the board how I've done the dissection again. I've broken the, the little words into the sentences. I haven't allowed... The, the sentence to maintain itself. I said, no, we've got to crack the, crack the code, we've got to crack the sentence down, break it down into the in individual words within the sentence. And once you break it down into the sentence, then it's easy to understand and manage and, and critique. And so you could imagine that in this one we just used Kurt Dan Dalap, um, which is... Um, um, which when you look at what the translations are now, we, we could have again, we could have come up with, you know, another ten Kurts. We could probably come up with another ten... Of of, of uh, the, the Dan and Dar and Al and up, but um, but for this one we just did the, the translation using one word. But the thing is that if we were to have a look at some of the discourse that's going on right in front of your eyes, what I want you folk to keep an eye at is the common thematic that's going on in each of those sentences. There's common words. So once you crack the code for one word, doesn't matter which way they spell it, then you start looking at the common thematics that are coming through the discourse that you're critiquing. Because once you, you pick up these little words, like, for example, up. Has any, anybody heard of any places with the UP on the end of it? <laughs> okay. So what I'm telling you people is you're already on the biddy. You're already, you're already on the cottage and biddy. That is the, 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 uh, the pathway of science. The knowledge of Nungas, of how to crack the codes. So if we said, well, how many places end up with up? There's <laughs> literally thousands of them. So the trick is, folk, you've already got one of the codes cracked, so you're never going to have to worry about what does up mean? Up here or up there or whatever, whatever up, up you're about. And so Dan or Dan Dukrani, tying together, da, the opening, we could have spelled it with an A with no L or whatever we could have done, any way we wanted. And when, you, when we use the critical evaluation, we realised that, um, you know, it doesn't really matter how you spell it. The, the, the message is embedded in, in, in the discourse within the sentence. Kutandala. Anybody know anybody that got married? There? Put your hand up. Okay. So now you know why. The intangible. You know the intangible things? You have this feeling but you're not quite sure exactly what it is. You know about intangible stuff? Yeah. So the intangibles are that people want to commit their life of love and amour. So where do you go? You go to Kutandalup, the place of love and betrothal. Even the Nungas knew that. That's why they called it that, the place of lovers. And I walk around that campus and I see students holding hands and looking in each other's eyes. <laughs> I even see staff holding students. I mean, no, <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I sort of plead... The fact that, you know, it's not the fault of the people that fall in love there, whether the staff member falls in love with the student or whatever, it's the sense of place. They've got no control over the emotions that go on there. But if you, if you read the ethics stuff at the uni, it's actually in, it's in complete contradiction to the sense of place. And I think us Nungar should hold the university to account about that. <laughs> Don't tell my wife, though. No. No, so, um, you know, this, the court, the court is your spouse or your lover, you know, your husband or your wife. So, um, already you can see, uh, Uncle Seelan, Uncle Seelan's one of the greatest Noongar speakers you'll ever come across, and how that man's not been awarded, you know, some 
honorary PhD or some bloody thing. It's got beyond me. Um, so all, again, looking at Bulladarling up, uh, Bulladarling up to me is a pretty special place because just near um, Kutandal up is Bulladarling up. And uh, from, um, from the School of Indigenous Studies, I'm going to walk across the road, head south along the river, and you come to a place called Bulladarling up point. In, in the foreign language, it's Pelican Point. So the I, I, idea for me was I'm going to go over to the, uh, to the, um, to the State Department. What is it? Uh, uh, DPA, Deport or CAM, wherever it is across the road. I'm going to go and see the um, boat people that float their boats around and tell them that they've got to change Pelican off and put the Noongar back, Bulladalanga. Can anyone say that? How hard was that? Pretty simple, wasn't it, really? Not like Mandelgutl up and blah, blah, blah. The tongue gets tighter. And again, in the, in the boxes, we just use the one translation, but you can see from the first one that if I wanted to write it ten different ways, no problem. You don't like the way I wrote it? Well, we'll write it a different way. But the translation, the little words in the big sentence is the translation. So who, who, do, who reckons that in the last ten minutes you've learned enough little words in the place notes to start the journey of, crow, uh, of code crackers? Who wants to be a code cracker? Huh? It feels like a bit of spies and military stuff. Secret squirrel business. Crack the codes of the ancient place names of the Noongar Buddha. Ngalakari Wotkulin, Yaokulin, Nyirokulin, Ngadikulin, Nganjenangi Nita, Nach, Kwela, Noongar Buddha. Let's go up and down and here and there and we'll try and search and find the Noongar place names and we'll go out and crack the codes. Because why have we got to crack the codes? Because how, how in the world are we ever going to become a nation state that can communicate with one another when we can't even translate the road sign down the road you know what what, what imagine if you lived in a in a suburb that meant ugly stupid people live here <laughs> could you imagine that and the Noongar start laughing at you and you're going what are they laughing at me for I didn't do nothing hey that's where the that's them kids here that come up that stupid ugly place and it was a really big suburb, you know, maybe it was a peppermint grover in the Netherlands and probably's, <laughs> probably's worth a bloody absolute truckload. Um, I, I don't think people would care, really. <laughs> so, Bulla Darling up. Um, the lots of, or the big, big one, opening, mouth, access, entrance. Uh, Ull is uh, over there or that thing there, situated at this place, and it's referring to the pelican, Bulla Darling. Bulladalan, the one with the big mouth, the pelican. I think on the UWA Student Guild publication, um, I think last year they asked me to give the Noongar name for their paper and so I, I gave it um, Bulladalan, which then obviously links them to the place. So here's a little translation um, and there's a couple of different versions there. Um, and even today, if you go there around um, Bulladalang up point, you'll see plenty of pelicans. You'll probably see some um, some um, some uh, Mali and swans and things like that as well, and plus other seagulls and whatever. <clears throat> so again, we, we slipped a little comment in there just to break up the, break it up a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, Ani um, talks about um, you know Nungars, other, other engagements of Nungars you know, uh, on the river. Um, everybody knows that Gigi means a um, rabbit, don't you? What, what does Gigi mean? What sort of spear? Yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a Noongar word. And um, a lot of people use these words. I mean, I, I went over east uh, to my Kuri Munis over there and we went diving, had the flippers, had the goggles, had the snorkel. I said, brother, hand me the Gigi. What? What did you say? I said, hand me the Gigi. Now, if I said that here in WA, people would pick up the bloody Gigi and give it to me. <laughs> but them, them curries over there, they didn't know what the hell I was talking about. No, I had, oh, no, give me the, um, the, um, the, uh, the Gigi, the spear. <laughs> so the, the other one, uh, what number are we up to, Linda? Four, three, four? 
พูดจะเกปลิงกับเกปลิงกับเกปลิงกับพูดจะเกปเอาอิงกับ and so you can already see that there's two or three small words at the end of these sentences that are actually a common thematics you'll never go past a sign now without looking at it and going oh uh, I think I can sort of see what that sentence is saying. I can't understand it all, but I can see that there's words in the sentence. If Professor Collard and his cronies, if they've got any validity or any um, authenticity, well, um, I can start to make sense of it. So, b u j a k e b a l i n g a p the place where the water meets the meets the land. Otherwise, you could use the word riverbank, or what's another word we could use for the, for riverbank? Hmm? The shore, yeah, the, uh, so the river shore. And river shore doesn't sound right, though, does it? It's more to do with seashore. But anyway, and of course, even today, there's plenty of um, reptiles and ducks and stuff there hanging around still. Um, so again, you know, just uh, uh, you know, using um, my dad's commentary, commentary, talking about bits and pieces. Cut j e n n i n g in bow. Where's that? It's probably um, it's probably the most one of the most visited spots in it, the um, hill over there at uh, Kings Park, and so Kart Jenang Ing Apo Jenang Apo. So you can see there's that thematic going on. There's those common words going on, and so I N I N Y or I N G, um, it's actually the same thing, but the translation is situated here, whereas I N G. There's another meaning for that, but places like Katanning um, and other ones that end with ing, um, the uh, it, it's referring to um, situated here. So if we did a critique of Kart j e n n i n g Bo, we come up with this discourse. If we did the translation of Kart Ta Ni Ining, there's four words in that place name Katanning, and so you can sort of. Possibly pick up that cart and cart is the same word, isn't it? Yeah. So that town has got something to do with the head, and I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you need to um, maybe have a look at that place and have a bit of a crack at seeing what you come up with. So um, you know, if, uh, like people today, um, you know, cart j e n n i n g b o for Nyungas was a very special spot, and I think some of the other folk will kind of give a bit of a description of of what people might have went there went there for. And what they got up to in the past, and even in the present. But the thing about it is, all this discourse is more diplomatic. It's more for public consumption. You know, there's some ducks over there, or some eggs in the bush there. There's none of this sort of narrative about what Lenny kind of implied or inferred, but went no further. These are much more. Um, um, yeah, it's what would be the right word? Less willing to be robust about other uses of the hill. So birit, um, birit, uh, or bidi. Um, the bir bir is kind of um, a word that implies, um, oh, you know, when you're kids and you walked across or through the bush, or you walked across a, uh, a field or something, and you kept doing it over, over and over and over. What happened? There's a footpath. Well, that's what a bir it is. It's a footpath. It's a pathway where people travel or animals travel, and so uh, the city of Perth. Um, my grandfather told me that um, the Nungas never call it Perth; <laughs> they call it Berit, Berit Buja Ngalak w o o d k u l i n g We're going down to Berit, what the w a j i l a s call, what the white fellas call Perth. We don't know where that Perth fella come from. They must have made it up. Of course, you know Perth in Scotland, so what the hell are we putting Perth there for? Or if you go down to Tasmania. First down there too, but the thing about it is, is that the beauty of the place names is that we can have our own place names. We'll be the only ones in the world. Why, why, you know, why would the next suburb want to be called, you know, Port, you know, Elizabeth Key for goodness sake? Why, why do you do that for? You know, my mum's name was Elizabeth. I, I really like it, but in spite of my love for my mum and her name's on it, that's not what it's called. What is it called? Or what potentially could have they called it? d u b a l y e r i g a n That's what it should have been called. And the thing about it, it's not out of the woods, people. We can change it. 
We just need to get the people to go through the process and say we want this thing changed because we're sick and tired of putting Anglo-British names all over our good country. So, so even the, even the land developers, someone's got to write to them and tell them to pull their head in and stop sticking um, suburbs with all these um, these foreign words on our country. So, um, yeah, a birret uh, could be Riverside Drive. A birret could be the you know um, Forest Highway down south, which is not Forest Highway, um, or it could be the road you know going from Perth to Fremantle, or even the road that you live in. That's the birret means the path, and and the thing about it is that the footpaths of the old old era, um, basically the Wadjalas um, followed those roads. And so there's a couple of examples there about Midland to York, the old York Road. Well, originally it was uh, called uh, King Dick Road. Well, King Dick was a Noongar fella, but I'm sure if they'd have asked King Dick, actually, what is the name of this road? I'm sure they would have got the, got the appropriate biddy, um, whatever it was called. Um, so, yeah, again, Aunty Janet. Um, talk, yeah, it talks about um, you know uh, Noongar to the east in the Balladon country, um, from York coming down to the Swan, and, and you know via uh, Beverly. And you know, this is a story of Noongar people's contribution to the to the development of the economy and contributing to making of this wealthy nation. Someone had to shift those uh, animals, and of course the Noongars were the labour that um, was involved in uh, building the, building the benefits. So there's um. Manda urine up. Uh, so again with this one, manja, manda, gutta, blah, blah, blah. So you can sort of see that the first part of that gives you a bit of a hint at that big long sentence on the way down to mandra. And then um, uh, the other thing that I've noticed as we went through, uh, part of the problem with the discourse that was constructed around place names, there's sections missing out of the sentences and that's the problem. Um, now you might say, but why, why did... That come about well. Um, if I asked each and every one of you to spell a word out right now, I reckon I'd get at least forty different versions of it. Do you want to try it or not? No, <laughs> leave that for another time. But um, for example, if I said uh, I want you to spell the word Moloch, Moloch, I'll put my money up. I'd get a, a lot of different versions of it. Some might catch it, others will. So I don't know. I didn't hear what he said, so I don't know what to write down. And so, purely because of that um, engagement, the, the oral dialogue to the listening ear, whether it was trained in Irish or English, or French or German or whatever, they heard it with their, their ears. And there's Noongar sounds that people can't pick up. I, I can pick them up because obviously my ears were trained to it. Although I'm probably going to be deaf these days. <laughs> So um, part of the, the challenge that we had was <clears throat> sometimes when, when we were looking at the place names, I said, I, I don't know what they've written down. I've got absolutely no idea. They've just jumbled this thing up so much. I, I personally cannot make head nor tail of it. Um, so sometimes you have to sort of just put it in abeyance and say, oh, we'll come back to it later. But without going to say, like the, tra the place of trade and exchange, where you meet your in-laws and your lovers and, and outlaws uh, at the gathering at Mandy, um, uh, Manda, what, however you say it down, Mandra, because that's a translation. And so right across the southwest, there's a whole lot of places that's got M-A-N or M-A-N-D or whatever, and what they're talking about is the place where people met and engaged in um, you know, trade and marriage and whatever they did. And so Mandra, we know, you know, when we were kids, and I think most people in this room that grew up in, in WA, what did you go down to Mandra for? For all that. And while you are there, what would you do? You went fishing? You might have saw a nice boy in the sand hill or something. Or maybe there was somebody you want to settle a, a blue with. And so, um, you know, the big Mandra festivals, people, people and families, hordes of people go there. And I'm sure that if we did some sort of a study, some sort of sample, I think we'd find that people are there for all the reasons that Noongars went there. So what was good for Noongars for trade and exchange? Wajalas picked it up. And they copied the Noongars. So, you know, so um, we, we slip in another comment from um, Annie Dory about Noongars um, in and around these places. And I think that she, in the end, you know, she says, you know, we, we, our people, have been, we've been robbed. We've been robbed. We didn't sell it. We didn't seed it. 
And so that's another hint that we, our uh, journey to recolonise our country is right on our agenda. And uh, it's going to be uh, through place names and the translations because um, people are going to have to come back to us to, to explain what these things mean and we're going to have to train people. So we start to close the gap in understanding and I think by once people start to, to develop these sorts of relationships, then we start saying, right, uh, it's not your fault that what happened in the past, but the time has come now we've got to sort this business out. We, ca we can't go on living in a land that's been uh, taken without permission because if we're a Christian nation, I'm not saying you have to be a Christian, but in, a, in the Christian world, what's the first fundamental uh, value? Thou should not. And we're living in a country that's done that. And it's been sanctioned by the government and the uh, governments all the way down to now. And people have got things that, that it, it didn't belong to the state, still doesn't belong to the state. And the state tricked innocent people into engaging in behaviour that I don't think most people would have done it if they knew about this. For example, if I've got something that I stole in my pocket, would you buy it? For example, if, I, if my convict ancestors, when they came over on the boat, if they would have stolen the Queen's hat or crown and hid it in their bag and it was sitting on my mantelpiece in Spear where I live, and the English... What are they, M, M, MI5, whatever they're called? Do you think they would say, oh, it's all right, bro? It was a long time ago. <laughs> no. Oh, we, we've gotten over it. It's okay. No. Just like the big blue in the world today, where Aboriginal people from all around the world are saying to the colonising world that went to their places and took their things and put them in the museums of Europe, they're saying, hand them back. You stole it and give it back, it doesn't belong to you. So one of the big things about um, you know, these place names, it's, um, the, the problem uh, was and is, is that I read material where in the early days, one of the governors said, I, he sent out a document, so I want to capture all the, youth, the lovely sounding Aboriginal words so we can have place names on the maps. And there was an argument that said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Because if you do that, you're actually authenticating and validating that indeed it's their land. But the governor of time said, no. Nah, we're going to do it. And off he went. So maybe he, deep down, <coughs> knew that he had to do that. And he probably said, oh, we'll, we'll sort it out later. So um, uh, the place called uh, today Point Walter, um, yeah, that's the Noongar name of it. And uh, people like old Pop Cliff Humphreys, you know, talks about um, these places. So the, most of these fellas are uh, deceased now. Uncle Sealand's still alive, but he's obviously referring to another uncle. And so like with the native title... Uh, argument that Noongars went through, um, uh, Uncle Seelan is not saying I read it in a book. This is all unbroken oral narratives that come down from generation to generation to generation. It was a bit like um, uh, my dad um, told me a story about the Noongars used to walk to Wajamup. Does anyone know where Wajamup is? Rotten Nest, yeah. Rotten Nest. And he said, this is to walk to Wajamup. I said, well, I said, well, according to the Wadula scientists, they reckon Wajamup uh, has been disconnected from mainland Australia for how long? How long? Seven, ten, a million years? Who cares, really? Who cares about the number? But um, using the numbers, if we theorise that, um, say it was 7,000 years, just for the argument, and we will theorise that the average Noongar lived to be 70. So if we divided 70 into 7,000, how many generations has that oral story come down? Anybody give me the answer? 100. 100 generations have shared that story. That's pretty deep. That's pretty deep historical narrative. And the thing about it is, I know, you know, as, as I, you know, I've been subjected to the questions of, oh, Lenny, you know, you, you're, um, uh, you know, you're not like them other Noongars or them other blackfellas. But hang on, you've got a job at the university, and when you get around in a nice car, and you've got all the trappings of, of, of um, the world we live in. I said, well, so, so what are you saying? But our knowledge and our values and our connection to our country is unbroken. 
we don't have to always go to a book to read about the sort of stories that these old people are telling us because that's what we grew up with. And so when the judge took the Noongars on the Noongar native title claim, the Noongars decided not to speak English to him. Hey, a buddy. When you know Buddha, no no got a yoke or making young Buddha, no no got a carriage in Nandara, no 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 got a wamala, no no got a darbut, carriage and but nanda, no no got a wamala, Anna. You don't understand what we're saying. We're talking to you and you can't hear us. You must be a stranger. You must be a foreigner. So why are you coming here to talk and make judgment on us as the bosses and the landowners? Why are you doing that? Go and, go and talk to the Queen. You speak the same language. Talk to her. Ask her if that's her country and take it off of her. And so, uh, so then I think the, um, the, the judge uh, realised that um, the so-called urban detribalised languageless Noongars in actual fact were still tribalised, they still were languageless and they still had culture. And I think that the um, beautiful thing about place names, um, it's everybody's business. It's on the highways and byways. It's on the suburbs. It's on the rivers and the mountains. It's in the streams. It's all around us. But as a nation of people that live in this part of Australia, we're still driving around in a country which we, we haven't really made the contact through the knowledge and understanding of what does it mean. Could you imagine a land or a country where nobody would explain what the place names were on their highways and byways, what would you sort of think about that nation? What would you say to that people? Well, maybe we start talking about that and we start saying it to one another because that's, that's us I'm talking about. I'm sure there's other parts of the world too that have the same challenge, but let's fix up our backyard first before we go judging other people. Yeah, so there's, there's a list of the elders. So uh, what, what do you think the common thematic with all those people's surnames? They're all family because they're the informants that we spoke to because they're the traditional owners. They're the informants that I spoke to about our country. And so all the surnames of those people there are either uh, blood kin or their in-laws. And of course, um, uh, Tom Bennell, uh, Uncle Seelan, uh, Arnie Dory, uh, my pop Tom, Uncle Joe, Arnie Janet, Uncle Mort, my dad, and Arnie Judy. So I use all those familiar terms to those people because they're my kin, they're my relations. So they become the informants to share their science or their cutage knowledge, understanding of the sense of place. So we acknowledge and thank those people for that. Um, for that, and I think only um, Dorothy uh, talks about some of the old grannies that were born and lived on top of Kings Park, and when they seen the ghosts, or what we know as the Wedulas or the white people that come to our country, um, you know, they they talk about you know these stories, and if you go down um, to um, uh, Elizabeth's jetty. Oh, sorry, Derby Yerrigan, and you see that big silver statue about the birds or uh, the thing in the boat. Well, that all comes that all comes from Noongar um, stories and explanations of the world. And I think that Uncle Seelan uh, beautifully uh, finishes it off. Anyone want to read the first paragraph? Who wants to have a go? Cool. And I'll read the English second page. Uh, Nicha Buja Kunyan Nicha Kuri. Maranging Buja Karlak Maya uh, Kunyanwa Deman Deman and Mam Wirn Kaya Mort Kunyan Deman and Mart Mam Lunacourt Buja Kunyan Kala Kuling Kulanga Borda uh, Jinaling Yeah, so obviously uh, we Nungas are still translating our words to, so that everybody can understand. So the thing about it is I, when I went to school, you know, when I'm going back to the start when I said I went to school, <laughs> I thought when I went there, uh, I realised, uh, one, that I didn't understand what the teacher was saying. I thought I, was, I, thought I had a, you know, I thought I spoke English. 
but I probably was more in the Noongar side of the English than the English side of the Noongar. And my friends always used to say to me, Lenny, yeah, what, what are you talking about? What, what did you say? What, what do you mean? And even as a kid, you're suddenly put into that position where you've got to explain things. So I think when me pop said, Lenny, when you grow up, you're going to have to do some talk. And uh, it's probably just part of the, the lifelong journey that I've been involved in. So um, there's no real sort of major, major drama. And uh, translation uh, is obviously going to be a big um, heritage uh, capacity in, in the future um, where, you know, those 5,000 place names, um, I think we're going to have to look at how do we do a, a southwest research opportunity where we engage everybody without exception to say, okay, let's see if we can figure out what these things mean and then we can write to Landgate and tell them to do the translations and then when the developers start developing new properties, no, we don't want Queen Elizabeth Street, no, we don't need King Charles Street, we just need the Noongar names, so let's make that the suburb and we put the words back because what do we want to do? We want to Australianise our landscape. If you want to live in England or the US or somewhere else, beautiful spots have been there, very nice go along, but once you get there, the Aborigines in America and in England are going to say exactly the same thing. We don't want those Aboriginal words from Australia on our streets. We want our own words. Got no problem with that. So, um, just to wind up, I want to say thanks everybody to come along. Um, my colleagues, I, I think Linda's here. Just want to say a uh, uh, big thanks to Linda for helping us out and uh, certainly for you good folk to come along tonight and um, spending a good hour uh, listening to this boring yarn about um, Noongar place names in the language. Thank you very much.